that. You have your Bibles, Philippians chapter number four. The title of the sermon tonight is The Truth, the Whole Truth, and Nothing But the Truth. Philippians chapter four, last Wednesday night we looked at uh, verses six and seven, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If I could draw your attention to verse 8 and 9 tonight. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. What a tremendous set of verses. What a powerful set of verses. All of Scripture is, is powerful. All of Scripture can, can cut us right uh, to the heart all right, and can convict us and correct us. But there are certain passages that I find in my life that seem to cut me deeper than other passages. There are some passages that just kind of just cut me right to the quick, and, and others I can maybe uh, qualify away. These two verses, Philippians 4, 8, and 9, are two such verses that get me every time I read them. It is a tremendous litmus test as we look at tonight the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Lord, I thank you for these verses, for your word, for your grace and strength. Lord, I pray you'd give us the time now as we look at your word that it would be free from distraction. Lord, I ask that the, the live stream would work properly, that there'd be no buffering or no, nothing that would hinder that, Lord. In each of the homes where people are listening, that there would be no distractions. That your word would go forth with the power that it has and it would accomplish everything that you desire to accomplish, Lord. We know that it's possible to resist your truth. Resist your word and to cause it to be of little effect in our life. And Lord, I ask that tonight that would not be the case on anyone who hears it. Lord, if there's someone who is not sure of their home in heaven, that they tonight would trust your son, Jesus Christ, as their Savior. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. We come to Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. And by no means, for most Christians, unfamiliar verses. And these are verses that, that if I, as I began to read, or you looked at them, you would say, oh, I know these, these verses. But most likely you know verse 8 better than the verse 9. What sort of things are true and, and honest and, and uh, just and pure and lovely and the virtue, praise, good reporter, right? But not always a surprise on these verses, but I wonder if we are holding to this idea, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I was part of a court case a few years back up in Bay City at a federal court. It ended up being a, a large drug case for a man who was running a huge amount of drugs in Saginaw. The case began at the Myers in Shields right across from Community Baptist of Saginaw. I don't think there's any significance to that. I just point that out as, as fact. It's just the truth. That's where the case began. In fact, they said there was a... a, a a phone there that they used at that gas station. I mean, I've driven by that many times on the way to see Pastor Jackson at Community Baptist of Saginaw. Once again, I'm drawing no conclusions, just merely telling you the facts. During this, this case, of course, as they had witnesses come to the stand, they had detectives come to the stand, and they had other people, that, that um, some informants that informed on this particular man. They would swear them all in. That they would promise to tell the whole truth and uh, the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help them God. And they would swear before the Lord or deity in front of all of us as witnesses that, that their testimony would be true. And then we were supposed to assume that it was true. It was an interesting case. I'd never sat on a jury like that before. I remember the day they brought in um, some of the marijuana and cocaine that the marijuana at that time was illegal. Um, that he was running across, and it was just the most amount of drugs I had ever seen in my life. Me not being a drug addict, I've not seen a lot in my life. But they piled it up on the table, maybe for effect, I don't know, but just stacks upon stacks upon stacks. In fact, halfway um, through this trial, I got called before the judge. 
by myself. This is not really a, a good thing. You, you say, well, what happened, brother? How well, I'll get to that in a little bit. It'll fit right into the sermon, all right? What we'll talk about tonight, see, it'll make you tune in for longer than five minutes, all right? I want us tonight, though, to look at this as we look at what Paul is challenging us. He begins the verse with these two words, finally, brethren. He's talked about a whole lot of things in the book of Philippians about his bondage, about unity, about being a light in the world, about his, um, his zeal and his love for God and his high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, powerful verses in chapter number three when he says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. A tremendous and a powerful book. And he comes to the end of his letter here and he says, finally, brethren, well, let me give you just a, a final thought, a final admonition, a final challenge. And the challenge, I believe, we find first in verse 1 of chapter 4. It says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and longed for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I believe that as he begins this final chapter, he is challenging his readers and us as listeners and readers now to make sure that we stand fast in the Lord. We stand fast in Jesus Christ, stand in his power, stand fast in Christ alone, specifically in verse 6 and 7 and 8 to 9 in our minds. He's, he's talked to us about the power of Christ and the joy of serving Christ and the prize of serving Christ. And now he says, there is a battle for your minds right here it is a real battle it is a a strong battle when life is bright stand strong when life is dim stand strong the battle is for our minds and what is in our minds is really really important really important in first Corinthians chapter 2 Paul challenges the Corinthians when he says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received, talking to Christians, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual and here's the key, but the natural man receiveth not the things of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man, for who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. What Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is that because we're Christians, we have the ability to think differently. We don't have to be trapped in the battle of our mind. It's not just because I was raised this way. You remember this story I told before, but there was one time I had to stop a young man in our school from fighting. He was in my office. He was a, a young man who was from a rougher background. All right, a rough home life, living with just his mom. Don't know where dad was, out of the picture. We're talking through the, the situation and why he had been fighting and, and how he couldn't do that. And he said, but Pastor Howell... I was just raised that way. Like I was supposed to say, oh, well, so-and-so, I didn't know you were raised that way. Well, please, resume your fight. All right, please, uh, my bad, I didn't know you were raised that way. Continue what you're doing. I didn't mean to stand in the way of the, the way you were raised. But of course, you wouldn't expect me to say that as principal. You'd say, well, I don't care how you're raised. You have to obey the Lord. And when Paul comes to us in 1 Corinthians, he's saying, listen, your mind can be different. It doesn't matter how you were raised or your experiences. All right, it's not an excuse. You got to follow the Lord and have the mind of Christ. So then Paul in Philippians says, finally, brethren, take note of this. Because of what is at stake, furthermore, I want you to look at some things that Paul told us to look at. Tonight we're going to look at, of course, just the first one, and that is, whatsoever things are true. Someone said it this way, once the devil was walking along with one of his cohorts, and they saw a man ahead of them pick up something, something shiny. What did he find, asked the cohort. The devil replied, 
that man just found a piece of truth. Well, doesn't it bother you that he found a piece of truth, replied the devil's cohort. No, said the devil, I will see to it that he sticks it in his pocket and only occasionally observes it as he would a trinket. You see, some people, now that's obviously not a true, we don't know what the devil said, but some people treat truth that way, like a shiny trinket to be taken out and say, oh, that's neat, that's what truth is. And then rely upon their own intuition, their own perspective, their own thoughts, the way they were raised. Here's a statement for you tonight. The battle for truth is a battle against error. The battle for truth is a battle against error. You see, error is a poison from the enemy. In Genesis chapter or chapter 3, the first few chapters of Genesis, we have the really the first error that we see that the devil himself introduces into the world. It is an error from truth. We notice tonight, first of all, the scrutiny of truth. The scrutiny of truth. There is error from without. The Bible says we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. We find that in, in our minds, the error from without can have something that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. You see, we are in this battle for truth, and there are some outside influences that want to tell us things that are true, but they're not really true. They want to tell us they're true, but they're not true. They want to tell us that we didn't come from God, that we came uh, from just an accident from an explosion that over millions and millions and millions of years, eventually we came like this with the hands in the right place, the thumbs that work the right way, and toes that bend down. And knees that, that bend forward, not backwards. They can bend backwards. I've seen that on, on, a, on a fight before, but they never end up walking the same, right? Now they want to say, this is just an accident, but we know that's not true. There's a, a battle from without. The devil wants to come and say, listen, you don't have to spend time in God's Word. That's, that's not, uh, that, that, that's not uh, important for you in your life to spend time in God's Word. It's not really the bread of life. You can survive without it. You can skip today and skip tomorrow and you'll still be okay. We have attacks from without. We'll have other ones that say, listen, it doesn't matter what someone really believes. If they believe that killing babies is okay, well, that's just their prerogative. And if you want to believe differently, well, la-di-da, let them believe what they want to believe and let you believe what you want to believe. The problem is that's not truth, right? That's an attack from without. They want to say, well, as long as someone feels like they're in love, there's no other boundaries. Attack from without. As long as I feel a certain way, then, hey, it doesn't really matter. There are attacks from without. The, the, the attack that comes is, listen, you don't, need, you don't need to be a part of a church. You don't need to be part of a church. You can walk through the woods. It's an, an, an attack from without. There are errors from without. But almost more damaging are the errors from within. Almost more damaging are the errors that come from inside of me and inside of you. You see, I don't, I don't believe that a Christian ought to drink alcohol as a beverage. We've been teaching on that, and I've taken a few weeks hiatus. We might come back to that. Might wait till we're back as a, as a church family here. But if someone came to my doorstep tonight from without and said, Here, Pastor Howell, here is a keg of beer. Error from without. I'm going to shut the door, social distance myself, and send Brother Mitchell on his way. <laughs> but you know that our minds play tricks on us from within. Not to drink beer, but to say, hey, you know what? So-and-so was rude to you last week. They don't like you. So, so-and-so doesn't think that you're a good person. So-and-so doesn't think this. And all of a sudden, we start to get bitterness in our life. Anger in our life, discontent in our life. Look what they have. They're more, almost more damaging is the error from within. And we're talking about the battle for truth. Yes. You see, the error from within, my heart is deceitful. We trust our intuitions. We trust our past experiences. The story is told about a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. He pulled into a service station to get some gas. He went inside to pay, and when he came out, 
he noticed his wife was talking with the service station attendant. He remembered that she had dated this attendant uh, before she had met her current husband, and the CEO got in the car, and they two drove off in silence for a little while. The CEO was feeling pretty good about himself as he drove the car and feeling pretty good about his life, and finally he spoke to his wife. He said, I, I bet I know what you're thinking. I bet you were thinking, aren't you glad you married me a Fortune 500 CEO and not him a service station attendant? That's how our minds work, isn't it? Yeah. Aren't you glad you're, you hooked up with this operation? I'm, I'm something, I'm somebody, and you're lucky to have me. Yeah. Our mind says that, but his wife brought him back to her spot when she said, no, I was thinking if I had married him, he'd be a Fortune 500 CEO and you'd be a service station attendant. <laughs> Our heart's deceitful, isn't it? Oh, I, I'm important to this operation. No, you're not important. God's important. My heart is deceitful. But I had this next phrase, but my head is deranged. Okay, my heart's deceitful in my head. Boy, my head can go all over the place. I mentioned last week that at times our minds will want to run a marathon. I was out running today before I came to church tonight. Ran a small amount, about three and a half, a little over three and a half miles. Do you know that in a run, there are three things that can fail, that can fail a person to run? The first thing can be your legs. You can be running, your legs can just not quit, but they can cramp up on you. If your legs cramp up on you, there's some ways to get through it. You keep on going and stretch it out, but it's difficult, you can make it. Second set is your heart or lungs can, can kind of stop on you. All right, you can't catch your breath, you can't quite get where you're going, and, and boy, it, it, can be, it can be moving, but you can kind of slow down a little bit. I've slowed down sometimes and finished your run when, when the heart or the lungs have stopped. But the third thing that can fail on you, I believe, is the most damaging, and that's your head. Yeah. Yeah. You can get in your head about a run, and that'll just stop you, I think, faster personally than anything else. Yeah. Someone asked me once, well, do you ever, to, to me, do you ever, Brother Howell, really enjoy running? <laughs> that's a hard question. It's a hard question. I enjoy the effects of running. I enjoy the mind clearing of, uh, of running. It, it's, it's mindless. I typically run without music so I can hear my panting and heaving. I'm not the longest runner in the world, and I, I've run more miles than, than some people. Longest I've run is 23 and a half miles. How long did it take you? Four days. It's great. It's tremendous. Now, about three, a little over three and a half hours, somewhere in there. Uh, long run. And even those long runs, 17, 18, 20 miles, you know, what, what do you think, Brother Howell? Well, here's what I think. In the first mile, every time, every time, I don't want to be here. Yeah. I don't want to be here. Even today, I'm getting my shoes on. You know what my mind's telling me? You know what? Church in a little bit, you could stay home and have a rest day today. Amen. I like every day's a rest day. <laughs> every day's a rest day. Because when you rest, your body's rebuilding for tomorrow. All right? So eventually, I'm going to be really, really, really strong and really fast. I'm just going to rest all the way there. But man, you're out there running. I'm out there running today. You know what? I get around that first corner. I know, unfortunately, now where the mile ticks are. And I kind of run by the mile and kind of, kind of know the pace. Mr. Swain, who was a tremendous runner, taught me early on how to run, how to pace myself. I normally know within just a few seconds how fast I'm running. All right? It's easy when you're running 15-minute miles, okay? It's easy. <laughs> then a few seconds. I knew about where I was at, and I'm, I'm running, and, and uh, I know where the first mile hit, and I'm like, you know what? You could just kind of slow down for the next mile. That's what my mind is doing. Because my head is deranged, okay? It doesn't want me to, it doesn't like this effect of my heart beating and my breath panting and my legs in pain. And, and I hit the first overpass, up the overpass, down the backside. Oh, going down's nice, going up not so nice. I know where the turn is for, for the, the, the next street and I know where that's hitting. I'm like, you know what, I could walk to that, to that tree right there. But I learned a long time ago that I don't want to be a quitter. And if I'll quit at this, I probably will quit at something else. But I tell you, that whole time, my head is telling me, it's okay, you can walk. I come down that road, and a, an older gentleman walks out in front of me. He's a little further down the road. I'm like, look at that, enjoying a nice leisurely stroll down the road while I'm panting and huffing and heaving. And you know what my mind's telling me while I'm running? Just walk till you catch him. Yeah. Then you can run again. See, our head is deranged, and I'm just talking about running. In every aspect of life, we have to battle the battle of our mind against the truth. Man, your mind's going to come in and say, listen, 
That person, when they sent you that text, they're so angry at you. You don't know it to be true, which is what your mind thinks. And, and then, then, then they're going to say, listen, you know that, that disease out there right now? It's coming to your house. It's going to get you. You're not going to live. I'm not trying to minimize the COVID-19. I'm just saying how our mind plays tricks on us all over the place. Living in fear because our mind is deranged. Our head is deranged. You've probably done this before. You probably have had to have a tough conversation. And before the conversation, you think about how it's going to go. You know you're going to say this, and then they're going to say this. Then you're going to respond this way, they're going to respond this way, and then you're going to say this, and they're going to get all upset. They're going to walk away, over, done. Before you know it, the world is over and your cat is dead. And you haven't even had the conversation yet. You're still laying in bed in your pajamas. Right? That's what our head does. Ladies have tremendous intuition. My wife is one of those ladies. Tremendous. I love it. But you, you realize, ladies, that your intuition is not always correct. Amen. Right now, in, in, this, in the auditorium right now, the men say amen, the ladies are just scowling at me. Thank you, scowling at me. <laughs> ah, I don't trust that woman. Mm -mm. Why not? I feel it. I can feel it. You know, and 35 years later, something happens. I knew it. I knew it. For 35 years, I knew I was right. I knew I was just waiting for them. Our heads go 100 miles. I remember the time that a lady here said, Well, Brother Howell, you walked right past me. didn't say hello in the hallway. You mad at me? I've told you before, if I'm mad at you, you will know. You don't have to wonder. All right? I will tell you, I am mad at you. I'm not a yeller. Okay, but if I'm mad, you will know I'm upset. If I walk past you in the hallway, it could be that I'm trying to get over to a practice, then I'm going to go preach, and uh, I just happen to walk right past you like a man with laser tunnel vision with no intent to offend anybody. All right, I can offend you without trying, I promise you. It's easy. I knew it. it just wasn't right. We trust our intuition. We've been here before. We know it's going to happen. There's an error, a battle for our minds. The error can be from within. But Paul says that we must focus on the truth. Whatsoever things are true. See, sometimes our past experiences, our intuition, they can be correct, but other times they are not correct. Have you ever thought that someone is talking about you? I have. You see people, and you know they're talking about you because across the auditorium, they looked your direction, both of you, and one of them smiled. We know in this vast auditorium, if someone looks across and smiles, I'm obviously talking about them. But that's what our minds do, isn't it? What are they saying? Oh, why are they laughing? They don't like my outfit today? Oh, is, is, my, is my tie messed up? You know, is my, my suit coat messed up? Oh, I knew it. That's what our minds do, isn't it? They just run, and they run, and they run, and they run. And Paul says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. You see, truth is different than error. I want to look at, first of all, on truth, some statements about truth. You see, truth is not relative. Truth is not relative. Right now, people want us to believe that truth can be whatever you want it to be, whatever you wish it to be. That's truth. That's not truth. Truth has to be based on something, and we base our truth on God's Word. Truth is not relative. A little boy was searching for a long time. Through all the cards at the Hallmark store, this was obviously before social distancing, and after a while, the attendant came over and said, Son, can I help you find something? What are you looking for? Do you need a birthday card or a get well card? Well, the little boy said, I was hoping you would have some blank report cards. <laughs> truth is relative. Some of us want to have blank report cards in our life, but truth is not relative and truth is not subjective. What is truth today is truth tomorrow. Let me give you quickly some scripture about truth. The word of God is truth. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. Psalm 119, 160. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Amen. The word of God is truth. Jesus is the truth. John 14, 6. 
Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is no way to heaven, no other way to heaven than through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is the truth, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. If someone says, well, if you pray to someone else, you can go to heaven, they're not telling you the truth. It's only through Jesus Christ. If you join this church, you can go to heaven. They're not telling you the truth. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But Pastor Howell, that's not the way I was raised. Remember, it doesn't matter how I was raised. It matters about the truth. And Jesus is the truth. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld the glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And Jesus came to earth and lived a sinless and a holy life, and he died on the cross. He was buried, and three days later, he rose again from the grave to show his power over death. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. What life is that? Life everlasting. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. Saved from paying for our own sins. Saved from being separated from God forever. Jesus is the truth. I'm a pastor. I feel like I'm going to get to heaven and God's going to weigh my good versus my bad. Interesting theory, but it's not the truth. Jesus is the truth. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you never trusted Christ as your Savior, you can tonight ask Him to save you from your sin. And because He is the truth and He is the life, He will save you tonight. And you will have a home in heaven that is guaranteed. Better than any guarantee from the government. Better than any guarantee from someone you love. He is the truth. Jesus is the truth. Amen. The Bible also tells us, though, that truth is a way of life. In 1 John chapter 3, John says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. It's a way of life to live and to walk in truth and to love in truth. Truth is a strength against attacks. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 14, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. And truth brings delight to God. Proverbs 12, 22, 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. You want to make God smile? Then walk in truth. You want to make the God of the universe happy? Walk in truth, or his delight. Oh, what's a delight? Well, this is easy. For some, it's Godiva chocolate. That's a delight. For some others, it's ice cream, a whole bowl, cookies and cream. For some, it's a ribeye steak, some apple pie, those things. I don't know what your pleasure is, your delight is, but for God, it's those that deal truly. Yeah. Truth brings delight to God. So when Paul says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, he is not just referencing some random concept. He is saying, I believe there's a battle out there. And there are going to be things that are not true that you have to reject and embrace that which is true. The question tonight, are you characterized by truth? Have you made a commitment to follow the truth, to allow your mind to operate only in truth? Do you saturate yourself with truth? Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true. If you go to the end of that verse, it says this, think on these things. A lady once came to Governor Nash. She said, Governor, I came to come to speak to you on the behalf of my poor boy who is soon to die in the electric chair. Governor, I have not come to ask for justice but for mercy not for his sake, but for mine. He's my only son. Governor, if you can do anything, do it for my sake. The governor was courteous and promised to look into the matter. And shortly afterwards, he went down to the prison where the boy was awaiting his execution. When the young man saw the governor, he mistakenly thought that the governor was a minister who had come to speak to him. He became very angry and insulting. He said to the governor, 
I have no time for you. And I will be pleased if you just let me alone. But, replied the governor, I have come to see you in about an important matter and you might be interested. The young man, according to the story, almost cursed and demanded that the governor leave. Very well, replied the governor. Goodbye. When the governor was gone, the warden said to the young man, Well, how did Governor Nash and you get along? And the boy realized that it was not a minister, but the governor. He fell upon the concrete floor and cried, I have insulted the only man who could save my life. Truth. What is it? It's based on God. It causes us to avoid error. And I believe right now, the time that we have to shelter in place, right? Like it, hate it, ignore it or love it, we're spending more time at home. But I wonder if you spend extra time with truth. I wonder if two weeks from now you say, you know what? I have more truth in my mind because of the time at home. Or do you have the same or less truth? Finally, my brethren, what sort of things are true? Then think on these things. Not on the things that our minds want to tell us or dominate our head. Make sure we have truth and we're lovers of the truth. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the truth that it brings to our lives. Lord, I wonder if there's someone tonight who has been battling some struggles in their mind in regards to truth. Lord, maybe they've allowed other thoughts, other hurts, other issues that are not true to overtake them. Lord, I pray that tonight they bend a knee to you, whether at home or here in the auditorium. Lord, I'd ask that if there's someone tonight who's never accepted your Son, who is the truth, as a way of eternal life, that tonight they would ask Jesus to save them. That they would pray, Lord, a simple prayer. And I wonder, my friend, if tonight you're watching and you're not saved, if you've never asked Jesus to save you, would you do that tonight? Would you pray, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. Tell him, he'll hear you. But I believe that you died on the cross for me. Would you save me and take me to heaven? I trust you and you alone. My friend, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, would you trust in the night? Would you not wait one more moment and you accept Jesus as the true way to heaven? And my friends who are Christians, would you make a commitment to follow the truth? Maybe during this time you need to recommit to allowing more truth to come in through God's Word. And not waste this time that God has given to us. Oh, what a blessing. As the instruments play, we'll wait just a moment. Those who are here can come to use the altar up front. Those at home can bend a knee. Do you allow God to work in your hearts? Thank you for your son Jesus who died for us. Lord, bless all those who are here and those who are listening. Lord, help them to live and walk in truth. Lord, help them to use this time, help us all of us to use this time to draw closer to you and your word and your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.